Introducing Recorded Content, a podcast for small, scrappy B2B marketing teams who want to get the most out of podcasting. In each episode, we capture stories from industry experts and podcasters. Listen in and uncover what it takes to launch, run, and grow a successful B2B podcast. Check out and subscribe to the show on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Let's jump in. Hey, this is Justin Brown. I'm the co-founder of Motion and your host for this episode of Recorded Content. Recorded Content is brought to you by Motion, a done-for-you podcast agency for small, scrappy B2B tech marketers. Today, I have artist Blake Jamison on the show. During the heat of the 2020 version of the pandemic, Blake ran a nightly YouTube show every night, 10.23 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, seven days a week. And it helped to put him on the map with his audience and fans. And Blake's background in marketing, specifically with Facebook ads, community management, and content creation, I'm sure helped. But at 30, he left all of that behind to become a full-time artist and is now working on collaborations with Topps Trading Cards and working on NFTs with athletes you know, like Terrell Owens. Blake is as interesting as they come, and I hope you enjoy the show. All right, so... If you build it, they will come. Consistency is key. Whatever cliche you want to use, uh, they exist for a reason. But I think the big issue people face is being willing to put in the actual work. So during the heat of the pandemic, pre-vaccine, so like, I don't know, mid-2020, I mean, you lived consistency. You put on a show, a live show, every night at 10.23 p.m., Eastern Standard Time, I remember seeing uh, the tweets and seeing your your feed go live. So, you know, in in hindsight, it's amazing that you were able to stay that consistent. But why do you think that content creators struggle so much with consistency? Oh, man, good question. Um, It's just building the habit and habits take a long time to build and you have to, like, get over that initial hump. And so, you know, I've read things that say it takes 21 days to make a habit. I've heard, thir- you know, I've heard all kinds of different things, but like it's, it's getting started is definitely a challenge. And then just getting past the habit point where then it just, then it's a no brainer, you know, and I was able to get into that, uh, you know, quickly. And then it didn't feel like work for a long time. Uh, it was just, that's just what I did every night, 10, 23, I'd go live and Sometimes I was, you know, doing creative things, painting. Sometimes I do AMAs, talking to fans. Um, I would really let the community drive what I was doing at that time uh, a lot too, which was fun, you know, keeping everyone engaged. And how, how did it evolve into a nightly show? Did one day you just decided I'm going to go nightly? Did it start off as like an impromptu thing here and there? What led to, what was the process in leading to a nightly show? Yeah. Um, I did one particular live stream where I was live painting one of my tops cards. It was a Ricky Henderson card. And the idea was I was going to paint two different versions and then I was going to let the fans decide which one I would submit. And that would become the tops card. That stream, I I had high hopes for it. I thought it was like going to be well received. And it was even beyond my expectations as far as the feedback that I got from the community. And it was like, I think I'm pretty sure I streamed the next day too. And I had done 1023 uh, as my first stream and, and then made and stuck with that for a few reasons. Everybody, as COVID happened, everybody was adding live stream to their mix. There was a lot of DJs doing it, painters, uh, entrepreneurs, you know, all types of content was being put out live stream. And uh, a lot of it was right after work hour, you know, it was 6 p.m., 7 p.m., 8 p.m., whatever, all, all of all the streams were going live at that point. So I knew that I wanted to be later than everyone else. I also tend to work late at night. I'm a night owl. I feel like between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. are sometimes my most creative hours. Um, and part of that is because there's no, there's less distractions. My phone's not blowing up. I'm not getting new emails. Uh, so I, I enjoy painting and being creative during that time. So I picked that. And then 23 is my favorite number. And it's just like memorable. Like if I just say I'm going to stream at 10, People will show up at 10.15 and uh, they'll be like, oh, I'm basically on time. But if you tell people 10.23, I found that a lot of people come I, I remember. dot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, so I, I, went and, I went and looked up your YouTube channel just to make sure, like when I was writing my notes, I wrote 10.23 yep. off of memory 
and then was like second guessing myself like man did i really remember that that random uh, you know time and sure enough i went to your youtube channel and there it was 1023 i remembered it you know a year later yeah yeah it's awesome yeah so So, it was it was that one that one time you know i got really good positive feedback um and once i streamed once then the next day i don't even remember what i what i did i think i might be like opened up packs of cards and then the next day i uh i started and then i as i grew it too i like built kind of content pillars so like i was getting a lot of fan mail over the course of 2020 especially once i started doing the live show and then i opened the fan mail every monday i would do mail mondays and people would send in stuff just so that they could like be on the show uh which is really cool and then fridays uh, i ended up just doing interviewing other artists and doing a lot of zoom interviews uh, with other artists and other creatives starting with people that are working with tops like myself but also branching out to other people that i met on twitter and how did you decide what these content pillars were going to be because and and let me actually uh, contextualize that question a little bit i think one of the things with podcasts that people struggle with is trying to differentiate their show and not just be like everybody else so what were some of the approaches that you took to figure out what the different pillars were going to be of your show yeah well those those two which were really the two that i stuck with the most uh what happened organically and so the fan mail was already coming in and i wouldn't you know i would open it up as i came or sometimes i'd let it pile up and i think i tweeted out to be like should i open this should i open these you know this mail packages on them on a live stream and everyone's like yeah and i'm just a huge fan of alliteration and so if it's mail it's got to be monday uh, and it was also like a fun way to start the week because, uh, you know, I don't know, Mondays are something that, that I used to uh, dread, <laughs> you know, now now <laughs> I enjoy every day the same. But um, yeah, it was a fun it was a fun Monday thing. And then the Friday interviews that just like I was interviewing. I, don't know, I wonder who the first person was, maybe Gregory Siff. Um, but I had an artist on and it was like a Friday night and everyone's like, Ooh, we love that. Try and get someone else on next Friday. And I'm like, okay. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, I interviewed probably 30 or 40, uh, artists over the, over the last year, which has been awesome. And I think that, you know, when you're doing any sort of, uh, online show, whether that's a podcast, a live show, whatever it may be, I think when you do it, um, the, the, is it successful is very obvious to you. Cause you're just really enjoying what you're doing. Like me with this podcast, I enjoy putting this podcast on. So that in and of itself is a success for me, but I am curious, how did you know whether certain shows were successes versus others? Hmm. Um, I don't really go too deep into the analytics. I know it's important and every once in a while I'll peek, but I just, like you said, like I try to have fun and that's my biggest KPI. Um, definitely, you know, I'm very active on Twitter. And so I felt like I had my ear to the ground there where if I did something that people really enjoyed, Twitter is how I found out that that was generally enjoyed. Uh, and that would encourage me to do more content like that. But yeah, in general, I'm not too caught up in, you know, the numbers. And I, I think that I think that a lot of people are that way. It's like you can feel um, – and, and that's very difficult for me at times because I sell podcast services. And so for me to tell a CMO that you can just feel that it's working um, yeah. sometimes doesn't exactly work. But then they go and they launch their podcast and they're like – I, I hear like that the podcast works in just so many ways that they didn't even expect that aren't you know necessarily specific analytics. A great example is um, one of my clients recently hired their first podcast guest, and I'm That's like, amazing. I don't have any analytics that says that it worked other than you ended up hiring this person. So right. it sounds like you're getting something out of it, and I think that's kind of the joy of putting on these shows. Yeah, yeah, and it, and you, it's hard hard to quantify because the things you get out of a podcast or a live show are sometimes like it might be an employee. It might be a new best friend. It could be a romantic interest. It could be, you know, a new client. It could be like so many different things um, that yeah. you could get out of it. And it's really hard to assign, oh, is this more valuable than that? It's like, well, it's, it's bringing stuff in. So that's good. And so, you know, it, it looks like you've still done some updates to your YouTube channel, but for the most part, it seems like the 1023 
live stream has ended. Uh, when did you decide it was time to move on to something else? Uh, I started winding it down at the end of 2020. I think, um, you know, it was tough for the first part getting in the habit. Then I built the habit, experimented with different types of content and did so many shows. I'm so comfortable doing live shows now. I could turn it on and I could do anything and feel fine, you know, doing that. Uh, and it kind of got to the point where it started then to get in the way of other things that were, you know, more important. Uh, to me in my art practice right now. And so I kind of wanted to start taking back the nights uh, where I still, you know, I'm still working at 1023. I'm just not broadcasting it to the world because, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I like part of the stream is being interactive and like reading the comments and then replying and thanking people for showing up uh, and, you know, answering questions. And that's really hard to do while I'm actually trying to like produce, you know, my best creative work. And so I'd say like Q4 of 2020, I took it down to five nights a week and went Monday through Friday. And then uh, very end of the year, took it down to three nights a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then finally, I just said, OK, I'm, I'm not going to do nightly streams. But whenever I have something cool that will benefit everyone else from it, them seeing it live versus seeing an edited version later, I still plan to stream that. And, and we took a similar approach. I mean, we, during the pandemic, I mean, it still is pandemic, but during the, the 2020 pandemic, um, I mean, we, we ramped up to as much as a daily, a, a daily weekday mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. And I think what you, you did and what I see is that, you know, you built this really powerful kind of community around yourself, um, within, uh, you know, uh, your space and, now you can put things out sporadically, like our show is a weekly show, so we're not mm -hmm. doing five days a week anymore. Yep. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is getting noticed, right? So getting noticed, uh, I, I recently had on Christopher Lockhead, who is um, the author of Play Bigger and someone who talks a lot about saturation and niching down and things like that. And mm -hmm. in the art world, and, and he used this example uh, in his answer, which was, you know, there, there are a million artists. It uh, doesn't mean that people are going to stop making art. Uh, you just have to be better than everyone else or find your way to break through. And so I was curious um, to talk to you a little bit about that because getting noticed in the art world is extremely difficult because it's such a low barrier to entry. I mean, someone can draw a stick figure on a piece of paper and say they're an artist. Someone sure. can create cards for tops and call themselves an artist. So what approaches did you take to get noticed outside of just – the badass work that you do. What what did you do to stand out amongst a very deep uh, competitive landscape? Yeah. Well, my path to becoming an artist was unconventional. I didn't go to art school. I studied economics and then I worked in marketing for eight years after college. And I turned 30 and realized that I was dreading Mondays and looking forward to Fridays. And so I wanted to make a change. Uh, and that ultimately led me to, to painting full time. And so once I started that, so 30 years old, I moved back home with my parents. I knew that I, like, I didn't want to be a starving artist. I wanted to run my art like a business um, and take it seriously. And part of that was knowing that I needed to focus, like, what do I make and who do I make it for? And that came from working in the marketing side of, you know, a ton of like startups and like apps come to the best mind where it's like, okay, I'd meet a client and they want me to help with like user acquisition through Facebook ads. And I'd say, okay, what does your app do? They tell me what it does. Who's it for? It's for everyone. I'm like, no, it's not for everyone. Like, <laughs> let's get, let's get serious about this. Like you can't, that's not how it works. Like, sure. You have the next Facebook. Eventually maybe everyone will use it, but you got to start somewhere like Facebook started with college campus. Um, and so when I was thinking about the niche, my first niche that I focused on was actually making art for offices focused on tech companies. And so I was targeting a very specific company that had just raised a series A, was moving out of a co-working space into their own office for the first time. They want to put some cool art on the walls that shows that their company has cool culture and they're not just buying like the same prints that everyone else has in their office. And so I was doing, uh, you know, portraits of Steve Jobs and Gary Vaynerchuk and inspirational quotes and, uh, you know, that, that type of stuff, but still in my like graffiti uh, inspired pop art. And that did pretty well. And for a year, I was the guy. And like, if you went to my LinkedIn, it would say, I make art for offices, you know, DM me, whatever. And um, 
and that went well. And then I was on this trip to Las Vegas. I was dropping off art to a friend uh, or to a client, and I met this guy named Jared Faison who had played in the NFL, and he really liked my work, and we hit it off. And he's like, dude, you should do athletes. I can help you. I manage a couple players. I, like, let's gift them some paintings for free, and let's get your foot in the door, and then this can like be a good thing. And so I did his the three clients that he first suggested, got to deliver them all in person, and like immediately went home that day on LinkedIn and changed my bio to say, I make art for <laughs> athletes. And, uh, and I never looked back. And it's crazy. Like it worked exactly like he told me would. Like we just, like by nature, these guys are super competitive. So one guy gets a painting, another guy wants a bigger painting. <laughs> he wants two paintings. Like, you know, yeah. it's, and they have, like, they have the disposable income for it. And there's also like amazing photographs of them online doing incredible things with their body. So it's like great. It's the trifecta of everything you need in a, in an art niche, I think. Well, it's funny. We actually went, <laughs> we went into your original um, niche. So we start, we were doing work for all sorts of companies from healthcare companies to nonprofits to associations. And my business partner and I both come from a B2B tech background. And so we did yep. the same thing we, when we, uh, we ended up bringing on um, a story brand consultant that was like, teaching us how to tell our story um, and to figure out which audience we wanted to speak to. It was just the same thing. I mean, I just said, I work with B2B tech companies on with small marketing teams of one to five. And now those are all my clients. I mean, mm -hmm. you just basically have to say like, this is who I'm going to work with and focus mm -hmm. very specifically on, on that niche. And then, you know, you kind of just through osmosis become into that space if, if you're good at it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Manifest it. Yeah, it, exactly. And and one of the things about manifesting it and building your presence um, is the building of your personal brand, which for an artist really just is the brand. Um, mm -hmm. When did you know that building an online presence, whatever term you want to use for it, an online presence, sure. an online personal brand would be important for the business of Blake Jameson? It's definitely before I was painting, um, you know, while working in digital media and digital marketing, I felt like one of the best things that I could do to prove to someone that I can grow their brand is to have a brand that people know. Um, so I was focused on growing my Twitter really early, uh, I think, in Twitter's kind of lifetime. Um, yeah, so I'd been building my personal brand. And when I switched at 30 from marketing to painting, by doing the focus on like the tech company stuff, it made it like it was still relevant content to all my followers. And so it actually like helped transition because like most people that follow me on Twitter didn't start following me for my art. They started following me because of like marketing stuff that I would put out, marketing content that I would put out. Um, yeah, so it was just uh, it was good. Like with that first niche that helped me kind of build bridge the gap. And then and then that way, like I I already have like a, a moderate sized Twitter following that like other pe people don't know that they didn't all follow me because of my art. Yeah. Like when they see me now. So I'm like getting the benefits from like the work that I put in, I don't know, a decade ago. Which is so funny because I actually didn't know that you, I, I've seen you talk about it and I looked into some of your background, but I didn't know you had such an extensive marketing background and the irony that I invite you on the show to talk about your show yeah. that stood out and you happen to have that marketing background that you were able to put into practice to help you to stand out. And we talked about, okay, what led you to stand out originally and yep. how you built that personal brand. What yep. are you doing now? I mean, with the rise of nfts and you know the the, the tops projects with artists what are you doing now to continue to stand out amongst your peers you know what's crazy to me is i do exactly the same thing that i did 10 years ago when i started going hard on twitter and that's video message personal video messages to the people that i want to meet and it's like that feature has been around for so long and the fact that very 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 few people use it I've just had such good, uh, good experience building my audience one by one and making it more personal connections because I mean, I'm, I'm like highly confident that that is how we met at some point in our early discussions on Twitter, I would guess that I sent you a video message. And if you look back, I mean, you could scroll on my timeline 10 years ago, I'm sending video messages to people saying, Hey, I'm, I'm so-and-so I do this. I see that you're doing this. That's so cool. How can we, how can I help you? Uh, that's something that I've just been, it doesn't, it hasn't changed. It's exactly the same thing. And it's like highly undervalued and like underutilized. It's crazy to me. 
And something that you've talked about is the sense of community that you've been that you cared about originally back when you were in marketing, and I know you care about still to this day. Um, it may be a different type of community that you're serving, um, but how are you fostering a sense of community through your brand? Mm. Listening more than I talk, <laughs> I guess is uh, is the short of it. I think that um, a lot of people creators and entrepreneurs love to talk about what they're doing and they they're not as good listeners and i think that um something that's helped me build community is try to like get invested and show them that i care about what they're talking about and i care about what they're working on or what problems they're dealing with um that's definitely part of it also like i don't know how early you um uh, got in on the 1023 streams, but like from the jump, like when I would do like AMAs and stuff, I was like extremely like brutally honest and vulnerable about things that were good and bad. Um, you know, there were, there were several where I would like read someone's story and be like crying on the live stream and like, not, a, not a sh like it is what it is. Like I'm an emotional guy. So I think that like showing that like sensitive side of myself and like paired with just like listening to what people have to say has been super helpful for like keeping like building friendships that are that are not it's not like a follower it's like this is a friend you know yeah i mean i sent a message to a group chat of mine 30 minutes before we got on here uh mm -hmm. we maybe we've talked about you maybe not i don't know um in the past and that you know the first thing that was said i, I said uh, you know i'm interviewing blake jameson in 30 minutes and the response was man he seems like a really good dude and i think mm -hmm. that just comes through in the way that you portray yourself online so i mean that that's that's good i mean it's good to be genuine and then it's also important to to know like how to do it and how to portray right. yourself and the way you right. want to be online yeah yeah i mean and it's also like that's a moving target always you know like even i think that i i do a pretty good job being like authentic online and, and trying to like, you know, I'm literally wearing a shirt right now that just says, be kind, be kind, be kind. Like this is, <laughs> this is what I, I live, you know? Um, but it's also, I mean, dude, the internet can be a, a dark place and a mean place, you know? And I can let that can get to me too sometimes. And I'll like snap and say some stuff that I'm go back <laughs> later. I'm like, oh, well, I shouldn't have probably, you know, Indulged. done that. Yeah. But you know, it is what it is. That's part of the human experience. We're not perfect. Yeah. So, all right, so just to wrap up as we're coming up on time here, for mm -hmm. someone else who has aspirational dreams of a daily or a weekly show, what advice would you give them to help them to achieve that consistency like you were able to do? Oh, man. Um, well, for me, like doing it at the same time every day was important. I couldn't have done a daily show if I was like, well, whenever I have time to record it today, that's when I'll do my show. So I think that sticking to a time is good. Um, late at night worked well for me because I didn't have distractions, but you might be a morning person. Um, you know, I get the same peace when I go to bed early and wake up at 5 a.m. And I have from 5 to like 8 or 9 a.m. when nobody bothers me. So I think like finding a time window that you can just commit to, and it doesn't have to be like, like I would do ridiculously long streams. I'd stream for like three hours, but set aside 30 minutes and just try and get past those first 21 days, 21 episodes. Uh, and also like something that I'm always like, I mean, I think a lot of creators are battling with is like wanting things to be perfect before you put them out. I'm, I'm always trying to make myself more of a volume guy than a perfection guy, because I think if I can just get in those reps, the perfection will work itself out over time. Um, so yeah, pick a time, make it short and sweet and put it out and don't be a perfectionist. I love that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I work with, I work with marketers and so that balance is extremely difficult of, you know, our board is going to see this, our CEO is going to see this, whoever it may be. Um, and it needs to be perfect, but at the same time they're running podcasts and, your show needs to get out there. <laughs> if we spend all the time, you know, working through um, every fine detail, you're, you're not going to be able to have a timely show in your mm -hmm. space. So I, I love that point. And as we wrap up here, last question for you. Well, two more questions, I guess. Uh, the first one yeah. is just over the next 12 to 18 months, what can we expect from you and what cool projects do you have coming out? 
Oh man, twelve to eighteen. Twelve to eighteen. Okay, months let's go like three months. Long time. Yeah, for you. Yeah, exactly, and, exactly. For, for so a business, I, usually you've got like th- you know your three year, five year yeah, plan. For you, it's probably yeah. more like a three month plan. Yeah, I do. I do like ninety day sprints, and yeah, so um, definitely a, a lot more NFT stuff. Um, I've got round two coming with the Terrell Owens NFT Gallery and Museum, uh, which is dropping very soon, um, and a couple other big NFT collab athlete collabs that that I'm not at liberty to discuss yet, but are going to be very, I think, exciting to uh, to be a part of. And also with Tops, uh, you know, they've given me such a big opportunity to grow my platform and grow my brand that I'm very loyal to uh, and, and really want to continue working with them. And so I, I'm hoping over the next three months we can uh, come up with a plan for my next set. I've got a f- some ideas in mind. I just got to get the uh, exec sign off, but it's going to be exciting. It's going to be something beyond baseball, which... Uh, I'm just excited to continue, you know, growing, growing the audience and growing my friends. I love it. All right, Blake. So yeah. last, this is the last question. I promise. Where, where okay. can people go to find you? <laughs> uh, Blake Jameson on Twitter is the easiest if you guys want to chat. And my website is Blake.art. All right. Well, Blake, thanks again. I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. It was great having you on recorded content. Yeah, thank you. Have a good one. <laughs>